However, it was not originally the intention of the author of the Book of Enoch's description of the calendar to see it split apart like that. Instead, the author proposed a model split apart into three seasonal sections of 91 days each. Instead of splitting the year into four seasonal parts as we have now with spring, summer, autumn, and winter, the Enochian system describes a world defined by only three main seasons for their entire year. It was only later that this system was divided up into four parts as we have now. It is possible it was divided into four because of the 25 angels called Anunnaki, meaning watchers, in the book of Enoch, who fell and became the accursed Nephilim of Genesis, or Gregory of later Enochian. These 25 fallen watchers, less by one, Sabaoth, who it was said repented, were described in vivid detail in the book of Enoch. Twenty-four fallen watchers can be placed around the calendar as two weeks of fifteen days each per each month of thirty days per each season of ninety days per each year of three hundred and sixty of three hundred and sixty-four or of 365. In the original version, the calendar was divided into three parts of 91 days each. The original number of Anunnaki watchers was given as seven who watch, corresponding to the seven sisters of the Pleiades constellation, whose names were Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Michael, Sarachiel, Gabriel, and Remiel. There were also seven angels, according to the Book of Enoch, who bred with the wives of men, the so-called Nephilim. There were also seven alchemical mountains that covered the area between where Enoch lived and the gateway to Eden, the entrance to paradise. There were, in addition, a total of 21 fallen angels listed in the Book of Enoch. Because the angels described in the Book of Enoch are all arranged in groups divisible by seven, and because the value of seven is the sum of three plus four, we may begin to see how the four-season calendar can be translated into the three-season calendar using the seven angels from the Book of Enoch as a guide. However, to best understand the meaning of the Enochian calendar, let us study the three main systems of calendars that arose immediately after the mythological global flood. First among these to arise in most detail was the Vedic calendar, as shown here around the larger outer ring for comparison with the common 12-month annular zodiac around the smaller interior ring. The Vedic calendar does not measure the Babylonian zodiac as it would read in the usual direction of months in a year. It reads them in the direction opposite this according to their use as a measure for the solar aeons of polar precession. The Vedic calendar is divided up into eight essential parts, split in half between them by a vertical axis, defining the left side of the circle as ascending, and the right side as descending. The names of the eras or epochs are the same on both opposite sides of this vertical axis and are reflected symmetrically across from one another by it. These are, clockwise from the top, the Sattva Yuga, the Treta Yuga, the Dwarpa Yuga, and the Kali Yuga. The term Yuga relates not only to an extremely long duration of time, as demarcated on the Vedic calendar, but relates to five of the six sides of a dice. Supposedly, a dice is thrown by Krishna in a game played in his dream. 
There are five sides on the dice he can roll that will continue his dream. But if he rolls the sixth side of the dice, he will wake up. These five sides of the dice in Krishna's dream, which is the perpetual recreation of our own cosmos, are the five yugas, the golden sattva, the bronze treta, the copper, dwarpa, and the most unlucky roll, the Kali Yuga, signifying an epoch of great destruction. It is said that if Krishna rolls the sixth side of the dice in his dream, then his dream will end and he will awaken, and our cosmos will cease to exist. It is this ceasing to exist in a single instant, and then flashing back into an entirely new reality in the next moment to follow, that causes the symmetrical mirroring effect along the vertical axis. The Sattva Yuga, or Golden Age, lasts the longest, beginning on a western clock at about 9.30, and continuing around clockwise until about 2.30. On the calendar, this era lasts from 16,302 to 3,602 B.C., a total of 12,700 years. It experiences a period of ascent first, followed by a period of descent. Its peak ascent occurred in 11,502 B.C., this peak ascent's pivotal nadir point is the middle of the Kali Yuga. Following the Satya Yuga, during a descending epoch, and following the Dvarpa epoch, during the era of ascent, is the Treta Yuga, meaning the bronze roll. The third roll is seen as less lucky than the first roll, the role of gold, but as more lucky than the second role, the role of copper, the Dvapara. The Kali Yuga, or worst role, is seen as the most unlucky of them all, and closest to being the sixth role of the dice that would blink us all out of existence forever. The sixth sided role is signified by a date on this calendar system that corresponds to the year 498 A.D. The Vedic calendar is very old, very basic, and on the surface seems acceptable enough. However, remember that the calibration of the Vedic calendar relevant to the placement of the Babylonian zodiac of the usual aeons is not precise, nor necessarily accurate. Thus, though the calendrical system works as such, its dates relative to those on a modern calendar cannot be exactly accurately fixed. Thus, most importantly, the Vedic calendar is flexible. Its spans of duration can be moved around arbitrarily, but the basic number of them and their relationships to one another is never changing. There are as many as eight possible yugas that can be mapped onto the Vedic calendar, and these can be counted by as few as four kinds. These golden, bronze, copper, and silver ages were known to the earliest sages of China contemporary to the later Vedic era in India. By recombining the broken and unbroken Tao lines, symbolizing the basic yes or no options of the Chinese Zen yin-yang concept, three times each, one arrives at the eight Chinese I Ching trigrams. These are seen here, emanating inward toward the yin-yang logo at the center from their names in the surrounding octagon. Read clockwise around from the upper right corner they proceed Kun, Earth, Tui, Lake, Chayan, Heaven, Khan, Water, Ken, Mountain, Chen, Thunder, 
Shun, Wind, and Li, Fire. The attributions of the trigrams to elements Mountain equals earth, wind equals heaven, lake equals water, thunder equals fire, gives us a visual cue for describing them. But in reality, all we are seeing here is a collection of 8 times 3 equals 24 Tao lines. These Tao lines are repeated as letters in many alphabets, the 24 Elder Futhark runes being the most similar and derived in essentially the same way. However, these 24 Tao lines, comprising eight trigrams, symbolizing the doubling of four elements, are only the simplest form of the I Ching, which is a system devised for calendrical interpretation of the elements, and which is used now for divination. When the two states of yin or yang Tao lines are multiplied by three, they form two regular configurations, heaven and earth, which remain unchanging throughout, and six other irregular configurations, called the trigrams of three dualistic Tao lines each. These are the eight trigrams of I Ching. If you take these eight trigrams and double each with itself, such that there is one trigram above and the other trigram below, you will have constructed the eight double hexagrams of I Ching. The eight hexagram doubles of these original eight prime trigrams represent the eight variations of fixed or relatively unchanging traits between the total set of eight possible trigrams and the total set of 64 possible hexagrams. Thus, 2 in 8 are fixed, and so are 8 in 64. The 64 hexagrams, formed by squaring the 8 trigrams, combining each per row with all the others per file, as above, so below, can, themselves, be arranged in a virtually infinite number of different ways. They are shown here in what is known as the King Wen sequence, named for the man who found it. The King Wen can yield a particular pattern of internal correspondence by comparing the first order of difference from one hexagram to the next in sequence. By plotting the changes in first order of difference between each hexagram, a graph can be arranged. This graph is what Terence and Dennis McKenna who discovered it, named Time Wave Zero, because it seemed to them to be counting down. To describe this interpretation, the McKenna brothers coined the term decreasing novelty. As the King Wen sequence progresses, the amount of novelty of the first order of difference decreases toward none. The 64 hexagrams are, as I mentioned, used today for divination for the very reason that, as the McKenna brothers discovered, as all possible combinations begin to be exhausted, as all recombinations have been tried, and as the remaining sum of untested models nears zero, and as the project approaches completion, the rate at which metastasis occurs accelerates asymptotically. Whether the King-Wen sequence can be empirically tested 